Hey everybody, it's Alex and Selm here with Unselm Tennis. Welcome to today's video. Uh, today we're going to uh, show you our training session, which we did, and we only worked on the ad court today. So we were cross court on the ad court all day, and uh, and I really recommend that you um, that you spend some time working on just half of the court. Um, more often you're going to be going cross court, but you can also do half of the court straight ahead uh, as well with or without the double zally is fine. Uh, what's important is just that you really specify that both players are on the uh, on the same page as to what they're doing, okay? So for example here, you know, we started off and uh, we're saying, okay, we're gonna go for rhythm. So we're gonna make this ball last as, uh, as long as possible. And uh, we're just gonna go topspin backhands back and forth with the goal of, uh, of getting into a rhythm because that's how the body really learns best and, and um, and makes things happen automatically, uh, which is what you want, because then uh, that's how you'll be able to reproduce what you know how to do in matches and not just in practice, right? That's a that's a problem that a lot of tennis players uh, that I've uh, that I've met throughout the years have uh, have had a problem with, which is saying that you know they can play they can hit the ball great in practice, but then they don't necessarily uh, they're not able to, to to reproduce the same level in uh, in matches, and uh, one of the reasons. Maybe not the only one, but the one of the reasons is because uh, they don't they don't work on on uh, getting into a rhythm with their rallies, uh, or just when they practice in general, getting into a, into a rhythm. Okay, when you when you do it rhythmically, everything happens kind of automatically, and then uh, and and that and that's what you want. You want to be able to play without really having to think. Okay, so rhythm is key and you're going to see like this ball this this ball lasts a little while and so uh at, at some moments uh you know the rhythm is a little bit lost uh there's some forehands that sneak their way into the court here and there or a couple sliced backhands um that's not the end of the world that doesn't that doesn't matter actually if anything it's good that you lose your rhythm every once in a while so that you can work on on reestablishing it because a lot of times once the rhythm is lost a little bit you're going to find that you're a lot more vulnerable to uh to errors and so instead of missing, well, work and see if you can uh, get back into a rhythm, right? You see here, now we're, we're getting back into a rhythm. There we go. We found kind of the, the ball trajectory that we're looking for, uh, even though even if for a little bit there, we, um, we lost it for a little, okay? So get into a rhythm, make that rally last uh, as long as possible, um, or give yourself like a little time limit, you know, say we're going to do this for five minutes or 10 minutes and, uh, fewer balls you use, uh, the better. If you only use one, great. Uh, if you take a few more balls, uh, what I recommend, which you'll see kind of throughout this video as well, is that, um, it's something that I learned from just, uh, watching the pros train or sparring with pros is th they like the ball to get back in play almost, uh, right away. So that way, even when there's a miss, it's the rhythm still keeps going. Okay. So you can see here now the rhythm has changed. Why? Because um, I'm the, the player in the far court, and so now I'm attacking. Uh, the goal is for me to kind of get to go for my shots a little bit while the other player works on getting the ball back, so works on defending, basically. If uh, Learn how to get get a ball back that's coming at you uh, pretty fast uh, with, with some spin that's, that's really heavy. It's not an easy ball to control, so it's good to work both ends, attacking and uh, and defending. Uh, right now, I'm the player defending, and uh, I, I think the key when you're defending is to not fall into the uh, just make it trap or just put the ball in play. Um, when you always think of us as a, as a just, it's like, oh, well, I, I don't need to do much or I don't need to be active. Uh, generally, what happens is we don't accelerate our racket enough, and so we don't, we're not able to control the, the fast ball as well. And, um, and we don't move uh, quite freely. We kind of uh, end up a little bit more paralyzed. So when you're defending, you need to stay active, okay? You need to hit through your shots, but maybe just hit through it with a little bit more spin, a little bit more height over the net, um, as opposed to if you are uh, attacking, okay? But uh, yeah, really don't fall into that into that trap. That's a trap that I've, I've personally fallen into plenty of times myself uh, and that I've... Um, learned over the years, but that I've also seen a lot of other tennis players um, fall into that trap, okay? So when one player is attacking, when one player is defending, that's a little bit higher intensity exercise, especially for the player who's attacking. So, you know, we started with some rhythm, then we took turns doing a little higher intensity exercise, and now we're going back into a rhythm rally, uh, but this time just uh, all slice backhands, okay? So again, I really like to kind of specify 
what it is that we're trying to do. Uh, if we're really just trying to go for rhythm, because you can do this, this exercise in a bunch of different ways, okay? Uh, here's a slice back in in slow motion for you to see. Um, it's not the, the, the best or prettiest slice backhand necessarily, but, uh, but just a way for you to kind of see how the, the stroke is done in slow motion. Um, but, uh, yeah, so when we're slicing backhands here, you know, you can do this, you can, you can almost play, play out the point if you wanted and say, okay, we're only allowed to hit backhands and we're only allowed to, uh, to slice or, uh, you know, you can go for, for, more aggressive slices if you want. I mean, the, again, the key is to really specify and for both players to be on the uh, the same page as to what we're trying to do, right? For example, if I'm trying to just get into a rhythm with my slice backhand and my partner is working on, I don't know, having a tighter ball trajectory and uh, not going so high over the net with your with your slice maybe and then they end up missing a little bit more, well, I'm not really getting into a rhythm and that player isn't also really able to kind of get what they what they want to do. So it's important for both the players to be on the same page as to which which exercise you're you're doing or what the what the goal of the exercise uh, is, okay? So you can see that I mean this this ball is lasting quite a while. Uh, yeah, we had uh, we had a pretty good slice backhand rally. I think I think this is the only one we did that day because uh, you know, when you when you do it well and you got into a rhythm, and uh, you know, we hit almost a hundred balls here. I, I'm guessing I haven't counted, but um, that that'll that'll do it. You know, you don't need to overdo things uh, either. If uh, if you're missing a lot and there are a lot of errors, and you want to spend a little bit more time on it because you don't have the the feel down yet, well, then I would recommend you spend a little bit more a little bit more time on it. But uh, here you can see, yeah, the ball's still going. <laughs> it's still going, and so. Uh, you know, we're just uh, we're just keeping it going, trying to last in there. Important to really breathe freely while you do this. Um, after a while, kind of repeating things over and over again, uh, it's it's normal. Your body can kind of lock up a little. There, I remember actually, my wrist was starting to get a little locked up. So uh, now we've moved on to one up and one back. Still just going cross court mainly. Okay, so. Um, here again, the goal has to be very clearly defined. Uh, me as the net player here, I'm not looking to, uh, to close off the angles or be too aggressive with my volleys. I'm just trying to be very, very solid and consistent. Uh, basically, you know, acting like a, like a human wall is, is, um, is your goal when you're the net player. And, uh, and when you're in back, you know, you've just got to, you, you're trying to push yourself. You're trying to hang in as long as you can because it's not, it's not very easy. The tempo is obviously a lot quicker with the net player. So um, you've got less time to recover. You gotta you gotta prepare your shots quickly. You gotta make your decisions quickly as to what you want to do with the shot. And uh, I I love this drill. I mean, especially being the net player, I could do this one um, all day because uh, I love to volley, and I like to challenge myself to really try and put the ball right where the player needs it to uh, help them kind of groove a little bit and uh, obviously I'm not going to do it perfectly so anytime I miss that well any any variance that uh, that I provide uh, is also going to be good for the uh, for the for the other player you know there's a there's a shorter volley see for example makes him have to react so that's not necessarily what I was going for but you know that makes him move up quickly and and, and works his legs and so yeah the key is to try and avoid uh, the net when you're the volleyer okay when you're the baseliner you're trying to avoid the net as well but you're obviously you're a little bit more forgiven if you miss in the net when there's um, when there's a player at the net than when you miss in the net when there's a player at the baseline. Okay, so there's a pretty nice uh, topspin backhand right there. Uh, you know, quick preparation follows through the ball pretty well towards the target, and uh, and so here we go. So here, you know, I can see the player starting to tire out a little bit. So once the player tires out, that's you know you're going to want to switch soon, but. You know, the, don't switch as soon as you get tired. You get a little bit tired, and then try and try and do a couple of balls um, with that tired feeling, because that's that's. That, I mean, you know, how many times have you played a point and you get tired during the point? Hey, you don't want to just like let go of the point or go for a bad shot or or anything because uh, because you're tired. You got to try and find a way to um, to push through it. Okay. So there's another little slow motion backhand for you guys to just kind of see maybe a little bit of technique stuff in the um, in slow motion. Uh, what I like to think of are you have you have you have a few different options when you're the baseline player here, but um, sometimes I like to to summarize it as the the three D's. Okay, 
uh, the, the three kinds of shots mainly that you're going to go for of, over here when you're the baseline player are going to be a drive, which that was just a drive right there. That's also a drive. Um, you're going to have a drive, the dip, and the dink, okay? Um, those are the three types of shots that you, uh, that you can use um, when, you're, when you've got a player up at the net. And uh, that's what you want to work on when, when you're here, just kind of go in with the cross courts. And it's also what you want to maybe try and accomplish when, you are, uh, when you're playing a point, okay? So uh, drive, dip, or dink, that's, uh, those are the three Ds you got to try and remember uh, when you're the player on the baseline right here. So there's another good dipper, okay? So the difference is the dipper is going to use topspin to get the ball low, and a dink is more using underspin uh, but again, the same same goal, same objective is to try and get the ball down low. There was another dipper that was more of a drive. Here in the slow motion, you can see this is a dipper, so you really dip the racket down under the ball well to give it a lot of brush, and so the ball comes up, but it starts dropping down as it passes the net and goes down towards the player's feet, giving them a difficult volley, okay? So it's a great way to uh, to protect yourself, all right? The key is just like with a lot of other stuff, you don't want to become too predictable. You can't just dip every time or dink every time or drive every time. Uh, you got to try and catch them off guard. When they're expecting a dip, drive it. When they're expecting a drive, dip it. Or do what you can based on what's uh, what's available, okay? So obviously when somebody's at the net, you can, uh, you can lob. Um, and the dink is a shot that you have to kind of play around with the idea of making your opponent guess, I, I, am I going to lob you or am I about to dink you? So that's what we're about to see right here. Look here in slow motion, you get to a, you got that slice preparation. And so technically you can just pop up a lob very easily, or you can squeeze that ball right over the net and get it to drop down low to the player's feet, giving them a pretty difficult shot uh, to handle right there. Okay. So obviously, if the player is too close to the net, what I, what I always say is when you're, when you're on the baseline here, what you're looking for is if there's a little bit of space in between the net player and the net, well, you're trying to get the ball down into that space. If there's no space there and they're, they're pretty close to the net, well, then you're, you've got uh, easier access to the, uh, to the lob, all right? Um, so we, didn't, we weren't lobbing at all in the previous exercise because we hadn't hit overheads yet. So again, you see now we're going back into maybe a lower intensity exercise and um, I've, got, uh, I've got quite a bit of overheads here <laughs> in this video because uh, one of the things, that, like I was saying earlier, is just the idea of getting into a rhythm. And uh, this is something that I don't see uh, enough players kind of do. That is, you should always take the first couple of balls here. So the, the first ball that we're doing here with overheads, you see, it's all about rhythm and it's all about getting into a, a, a rally with the player on the other side. And, uh, and, you know, believe it or not, when one player is hitting an overhead and the other is trying to hit a lob, that's not easy to rally like that, okay? You actually have to have a pretty good level already to be able to do that. Um, but you should spend, you know, spend a minute or two. Like you can see, I'm not trying to hit my overhead very hard at all. In fact, I always tell a lot of players, you know, it's hard to hit soft. Um, and so once you've gotten into a rhythm, you know, you see here I've gotten at least 10, 15 overheads. Now I'm going to start to add a little bit of pace to the ball. Okay, go for it a little bit more because now if I miss or or my partner can't hit the ball back, it's not the end of the world. I got I got my share of uh, of overheads. I got a good rhythm, and so I'm happy. Okay. So once the shoulders warmed up for the overheads, now we can do a little bit of one up, one back, but we're we're varying a little bit more. Okay. So before the net player was kind of uh, passive to a certain extent. We'll say uh, just just staying on the service line and blocking the ball back, being a wall. Uh, in this case, in this exercise, when there's a little bit of up and back movement, the, the baseline player is more the player who's, uh, who's not as active. Um, and I don't mean like physically, I just mean with what they're trying to do with the ball. So they're just trying to, to, to work the net player, move the net player up, move the net player back. Uh, so when, you, when they move back, you get overheads. When you move up, you know, you're doing, you've got low first volleys like that one, a little setup volley. Um, you can also have a couple closing volleys, but... You know, once once you close the angles off enough here, you see I'm getting closer to the net, and once you get once you get close enough to the net, 
uh, the other player, that's when the other player should decide to to back you off of the net and uh, and pull out a lob. Okay. Again, you can see that we're not playing the point. Uh, we're not like kind of playing the point. Okay. I'm not trying to make my opponent miss or end the point. No. Again, I, I want to kind of be in rhythm if I can and. Um, and yeah, and just play with uh, with your partner, okay? So it's not either like we're trying to help each other. We're actually trying to challenge each other a little bit. So my partner's doing it by maybe trying to challenge me by getting the ball kind of low or pushing me back off of overheads or giving me some tricky shots, um, but without trying to actually make me miss, okay? And so again, here we switch positions and uh, what are we gonna see? We're gonna see that first off, it's rhythm, okay? The first ball is always a ball where you know, the player is going to hit at least uh, five, ten overheads in a row off of the ball before they really start going for the shot, okay? And while we're on the topic of overheads, uh, let me just point out that a common tip you hear on overheads is to kind of point to the ball with your, um, with your non-hitting arm. And that is a technique that's used by some players, but it's, it's more of a rarity. Here what you're going to see is that you see there's a, a unit turn that starts off. So the, the player accompanies the racket with the non-dominant hand around the neck and turns the shoulders in that way, similarly to what you would do on a forehand or, or a backhand stroke, okay? And uh, I find that that's, con that's a, more, a more common approach. First of all, more players hit that kind of approach. Uh, also because it's just, from a biomechanical point of view, it's just more sound um, to, uh, to hit the ball that way. Uh, but why, why is there conflicting information sometimes online or why will you hear these things? It's, uh, it's because there, there's not just one technique for, for any stroke, okay? And like I just showed you there in the slow motion, uh, you know, Hugo and, and myself, actually, we both use a unit turn for the overhead. That's not to say that you're not going to see some players uh, release the racket a little bit sooner or, you know, separate the racket from the non-hitting hand uh, sooner and maybe spend a little bit more time with that left arm up pointed at the at the ball than somebody who does a, a unit turn, okay? I think of a player maybe like Tsitsipas. He's a, he's a guy who lets go of the racket uh, earlier, okay? Um, and there's there's nothing there's nothing wrong with that. You know, there's plenty of, of great tennis players who have not necessarily had very uh, common techniques, okay? Uh, but yet, you know, it's worked out wonderfully uh, for them, all right? Uh, I mean, a couple examples I think of, uh, I mean, you have Rafael Nadal's forehand is not a conventional way to hit the ball, okay? And uh, and it's not a way that's, that's very recommended to try and teach players to to hit the ball in this way, but, you know, it works pretty well for uh, for Rafa, so uh, I, I have I don't see anything wrong with uh, with him hitting the forehand the way the way that he does. Um, another great shot uh, I like to think of is uh, is Andy Roddick's serve, uh, which is kind of a peculiar motion, uh, which works great for him, but it's maybe not necessarily the the right technique to use for everybody else. Okay, so if you kind of get that, maybe hopefully that'll help you navigate through some of this all this conflicting information. Sometimes you see uh, online or in tennis videos or even in the teaching communities. Um, yeah, there's not there's not just one technique. So there's not you can't you can't just teach any any one way of uh, of, of hitting the ball. Okay. So now we've moved on to volley volley. All right. So when you're going up and back, that's again the the heart rate's going to come up a little bit. So here we're just kind of stabilizing the the heart rate. So both players are. Um, or at a steady heart rate. And you can see we're doing volley volley, but we're doing it in a way where we're not trying to close or anything right now. We're just trying to stay back by the service line and, uh, and, and again, get into a, a rhythm. And the goal here is going to be to get the ball to the other player's racket. If the ball bounces first, uh, that's not a good idea. That means you didn't hit a good, clean, quality volley, okay? Uh, now that we're closing, all right, this is a very fun uh, and popular drill. Uh, where we start, we both start about no man's land, so that's in between the service line and the baseline, and uh, and we play out the court cross court. And in this case, yes, we do it with doubles alleys because this is very much a uh, a doubles drill. Uh, here's one. If anybody's ever seen the uh, Brian Brothers exhibition or fundraiser, you're going to see that uh, this is one of the uh, three or four drills that they uh, that they always show uh, in their fundraisers or their exhibitions. Uh, if anybody would like to uh, to see a video on on the, the couple different exercises, because I've seen the Brian Brothers, oh, almost 
20, 25 years of fundraisers, exhibitions, uh, growing up through in, in junior tennis. I mean, they come from Camarillo, California. I, I'm, I'm from Santa Monica, California, so it's like 30, 40 minutes away. And and uh, I played college tennis at UCSB, which is where um, where Wayne Bryan also played uh, played in college. And Wayne Wayne is the the Bryan brothers' dad. Um, Wayne does. Uh, Wayne is a, an amazing. Um, what would I call him? I wouldn't even call him. He's not a tennis coach, but he's just in terms of uh, in terms of putting a, the atmosphere in, a, in the, on the tennis court. I mean, there, there's nobody better. I mean. Uh, it's it's pretty hard not to have fun when uh, when Wayne Bryan is uh, is around. So now we've uh, we expanded the drill just a little bit, uh, where again it's just playing out the point uh, cross court on half of the court, uh, but we've added serve and return now. So just uh, elaborating it a little bit. Now I'm a player you can see who likes to come to the net. Uh, I will serve and volley on, in, in doubles or if we're on half of the court, I'm always looking to come in. Uh, you can stay back if you want. You can see Hugo was mostly staying back on, on his serve. Um, I know a lot of coaches and, uh, try and really insist on having the players come to the net in doubles. And even though that's that's personally what I like to do, uh, you know, I recognize watching a lot of pro doubles that, I mean, one of the differences you're going to see maybe between 10 or 20 years ago, which is where everybody was serving and volleying, or coming to the net, you're going to see that nowadays even a lot of pretty successful double teams, uh, a lot of players are playing back. So I, I don't like this idea of making players come to the net or, or making them have to come to the net. Uh, some players or coaches, you know, just tell their kids to, to, to do that because they want them to work on volleys. But um, I don't find that's the best way to work on uh, on the volleys. Because you're actually teaching them a poor strategy, you're kind of teaching them to go and play and, and do something which is um, which is not natural to them. But anyway, here, what am I showing? Uh, I slowed this down to show you how you kind of here. I split step twice almost. I split step once to slow down because I was out of position, and so and because he's hitting a forehand and I can't read where he's going, I have to respect either direction. So I wanted to slow down before my my reaction split step, which is the one I've got right here where I'm reacting to the ball. Uh, it's important to do this, especially on, on clay, because it's very hard to change directions on clay, which is why you see the behind-the-back play used a lot. And uh, so sometimes if you're running from the other direction, you don't slow down before your split step, you're going to find that uh, it's pretty hard to, to change directions. All right? So, yeah, in, in the end here, nice to finish off with just a few. Um, we played a super tiebreaker uh, on the singles court. And uh, and here's an example of a point that um, oh darn I, I I wish I could have uh, wish I could have done better on this point because you're gonna see the couple of mistakes I do okay so first off it starts off well because I, I get my serve in and I get a forehand and you can see that I'm dictating however here I I don't read the play well and I move in too much which means I'm hitting the next ball. Uh, backing up and I can't hit it aggressively. So luckily I place it well and I still remain relatively in control of the point and get myself to another forehand. But here's the next mistake is you can see that I had to back up before I hit this shot and yet I attempted a drive inside in shot which was maybe a little bit overly ambitious uh, for me there. I would have probably been more rewarded for a higher trajectory inside in ball, or I think the best option would have just been kind of a, uh, a heavy high topspin ball uh, inside out back to his backhand. But I didn't really want to relinquish the control of the point, so at least I got to finish it off there with a nice, uh, a nice backhand or forehand winner uh, to uh, to end the super tie break. So anyway, that was that was it for today's practice. Hope that guys help. Hope that helps you guys a little bit. Um, and seeing that you can you can use just half of the court and still get a great training session in, and uh, and there's a bunch of ways you want to you want to vary it up so that you don't you know um, get too tired physically or, or or burn out or or get bored mentally either. If you just do only rhythmic stuff, you're going to get bored. Uh, if you only do high intensity stuff, you're going to burn out physically and you're not going to be able to keep it up. So it's important to kind of vary it in between the two. Okay. Anyways, hope you guys like that, and uh, we'll see you on the next one.